Welcome to Let the Quran Speak. Aya Hashim was killed. She was shot by a passing car in Blackburn, UK. After her death, Muslims rallied in support of her cause and to support her family. But then it became clear that she was a Shiite Muslim and things changed. So we're talking about anti-Shiite sentiments in the Muslim community. With me is Dr. Shabir Ali from the Islamic Information Center. Dr. Shabir, welcome to Let the Quran Speak. It's my pleasure to be on, Safiya. Sorry that we're talking about such uh, a sad topic. Yes. I mean, this, this story sort of uh, made it clear that there are these anti-Shia um, ideas within the Muslim community. So I thought it was important that we address those ideas uh, on the show. Um, tell me, Dr. Shabir, why do you think that Muslims, that Sunni Muslims have these ideas towards Shiites? Well, I think generally when there is a sectarian split in religions, uh, um, th there is some... Uh, um, um, uh, some, some bad feeling from, from each side to the other. And uh, mm -hmm. because Shi'is have uh, tended to be the minority, uh, they have uh, suffered the brunt of, uh, of, of this uh, uh, contempt from, from the other side over history. Mm -hmm. So tell me how it all started. Uh, I understand this has historical and political roots. Tell me about that. Yeah, in, in terms of, well, the history and politics are intertwined, but let me explain that. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace is recognized by all Muslims, uh, Mus uh, Sunnis and Shi'is alike, uh, as the last of the prophets, uh, as uh, the messenger of God. And uh, during his lifetime, naturally, he gathered uh, followers. Some of his followers were from among his own family members, uh, his uh, wives, his uh, children, naturally, and uh, even among his cousins. Now, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, had uh, been orphaned uh, very early. His uh, father died before he was even born, while he was still in his mother's womb. And uh, his mother died uh, when he was uh, a child. And so he soon found himself being shifted around, first in the care of his uh, grandfather, and then uh, after his grandfather died, in the care of his un uncle, uh, uh, Abu Talib. Now, uh, Abu Talib's son, naturally the, the cousin of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, Ali, uh, was to form a lasting relationship with the Prophet. He was younger than the Prophet, and the Prophet, peace be upon him, began to take care of him after this uncle passed away. Uh, so uh, I know a lot has been mentioned there, and I hope that our viewers mm -hmm. can keep track of who is who and who passed away. But now, focusing on the main players uh, of the uh, uh, Sunni Shi'i split. We have uh, Ali, the cousin uh, of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and uh, he would eventually get married to the Prophet Muhammad's own daughter within his lifetime. Uh, and uh, this daughter of the Prophet, peace be upon him, named Fatima, uh, passed away within uh, six months after the death of the Prophet himself. And uh, and nonetheless, uh, she, her legacy lives on, uh, both uh, in, uh, in Shi circles and in, in Sunni circles. Now, she had uh, two uh, wonderful sons, Hassan and Hussein, who uh, play a, an ample role in uh, Muslim history. And um, uh, Hussein, the younger of the two boys, uh, was massacred by one of the Sunni caliphs. Well, one of the caliphs who naturally came to be recognized among the, the Sunnis. He was historically the known caliph at the time. Uh, but mm -hmm. uh, Sunnis tended to prize the caliphs and uh, central rule, uh, whereas uh, Shi'is tended to uh, feel a lot of sympathy um, uh, for the family of the Prophet peace be upon him, and uh, an enhanced uh, sense of that sympathy, especially in the light of the brutal say, uh, slaying of the Prophet's grandson. This was too much uh, for people to accept. And uh, an old uh, rife within the community uh, took on uh, new dimensions uh, with that uh, gruesome murder of the Prophet's grandson. Mm -hmm. So how did that lead to this to this? big division between Shiite and Sunni Muslims. 
Well, it, within uh, the uh, few years after the death of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, there was uh, ill feeling among uh, some uh, segments within the Muslim uh, population. Uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, apparently did not uh, leave very clear instructions as to who should be the temporal ruler after him. He naturally, as the Prophet of God, was privy to divine revelation, and uh, that was quite unique to him. That is a privilege that would not be passed on. Uh, however, I need to say something more about that. But let me get, let me stick with the political dimension for a moment. Okay, uh, and so, I'm wondering if, if Shiites think that too. If, if Shiites also think that, um, you know, there wasn't a clear successor. Uh, well, there too, we have a difference of, uh, of opinion. Uh, okay. but let, let me trace a broad narrative and then I'll come back to the nuances that uh, are needed, need to be added to this. So, okay, let me speak of it from the Sunni perspective because uh, there, there is really hardly a neutral ground here. One has to say uh, that there are two different memories of what happened and, mm -hmm. uh, and these two different memories are played out, one in Sunni circles the other in Shi circles. Uh, because mm -hmm. uh, I happen to come from the Sunni background historically, uh, and I can hardly uh, profess to be free of all of my Sunni uh, presuppositions, uh, mm -hmm. because nobody is entirely uh, unbiased, and, and this is my mm -hmm. particular bias. So let's confront that, and, and, and then let me describe it from that perspective, and then try to okay, be as fair for, as I... Thank you for acknowledging that. <laughs> yeah, and then I'll try to be as fair as I can uh, okay. in representing the, the Shi'i perspective on this as well. So mm -hmm. the Sunni perspective is largely collected in massive books of history uh, written by great scholars such as uh, Ibn Hisham and his predecessor Ibn Ishaq uh, and uh, Abu Jafar al-Tabari coming uh, even uh, later than that. So uh, these uh, massive history books uh, give basically uh, the perspective that would come to be known and prized in Sunni circles uh, with also some hints that one would see as being supportive uh, of uh, the other view. And, and that is because, uh, Sophia, in those days, uh, the, the lines were not completely drawn between Sunnis and Shi'is. The lines would come to okay. be drawn much later. So there was a period in Islamic history in which one could not say that this person is a Sunni, that one is Shi'i. Uh, and, and then too, even without calling the names, one could not draw a clear distinction between uh, those who are of this this view or that view. Uh, people mm -hmm. may have had a mixture of views and, and perhaps alternating views. Uh, as human beings, we know that we don't always wake up with the same view every day. There are some deep-seated mm -hmm. convictions which do not change, uh, but uh, we may change our opinions about certain uh, less uh, 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 central uh, to our faith. So. Uh, in, in these classical works of Islamic history, though representing largely the Sunni perspective, we also find tinges uh, that, would, uh, that could be called in support of the other perspective. Now, what is the other perspective and where is it from? Uh, the other perspective comes largely through uh, reports that were passed on uh, by oral tradition and then eventually in writing uh, through a line of succession uh, within uh, mainly the circles of of the Prophet's family. Uh, the, okay. the books that come to enshrine that uh, and uh, that are in our presence now uh, come a little bit later uh, than the Sunni collection. So we have major collections of Sunni books, especially in the third century with the rise of the Hadith literature. So we have the compilations of Imam Bukhari and Muslim from the third century. Uh, in mm -hmm. comparison with that, we have uh, a Shi'i collection of uh, Hadith, which is referred to uh, uh, al usul al-Kafi, and uh, this was compiled uh, probably in the century after the Sunni Hadith books were collected. And so um, uh, from, from a sheer historical point of view, if one wanted to find the earliest written collections, it looks like the, uh, the Sunni collections are the earlier ones. But of course, uh, for uh, our Shi'i brothers and sisters, their uh, collections naturally are prized, and uh, these are 
uh, uh, sought out as the sources of information for what happened uh, earlier on. So what exactly happened earlier on? So we see the two perspectives from the Sunni collections. Uh, we have indications that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, made overtures towards Abu Bakr, one of his closest companions and his father-in-law mm -hmm. at the same time, uh, that, that he, Abu Bakr, the father-in-law and close companion of the Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, would naturally be a leader after him. What are these indications? So here too, it, it, it's not a very clear and direct prescription that Abu Bakr should be the one. Uh, it is uh, more like some circumstantial things. Uh, what are they? Uh, one is that uh, somebody recalls that the Prophet, peace be upon him, said to uh, a person who had come to visit him that when you come back, if you don't find me, go to Abu Bakr. Uh, so mm -hmm. some would take that as a proof that Abu Bakr was to be in the place of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Uh, during the last illness of the Prophet, uh, he was not able to come out as usual and lead the community in prayer uh, for a couple of days. And uh, it, during those days, it is reported in the Muslim Sunni collections of hadith that the Prophet, peace be upon him, instructed his wife Aisha to tell her father, Abu Bakr, to go and lead the prayer. And though she protested, the Prophet, peace be upon him, insisted, and eventually Abu Bakr was there leading the prayer. Now it so happens, according to the Muslim history books, that the Prophet, peace be upon him, recovered uh, for uh, a day, and then he actually came and joined the prayer, and Abu Bakr wanted to move back to give the Prophet space to lead uh, and to get into the foremost position, but the Prophet, peace be upon him, actually demurred and followed Abu Bakr. Uh, so mm -hmm. this first on these would be a clear indication that Abu Bakr should be the leader after him. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess Shiites don't accept that those that narrative that you're describing. Then on, uh, you're right. Uh, it would not be uh, accepted at least in all of these details. And on the other hand, um, our Shiite brothers and sisters uh, have uh, narratives which they can point to in Sunni sources uh, that would uh, uh, show the preeminence of uh, Ali. And uh, Ali uh, is shown to be with the Prophet peace be upon him at every juncture. I know we're probably running out of time here, uh, but uh, you will indicate to me uh, how, how much we can go into detail. Uh, but uh, uh, just to be quick, uh, Ali was one of the earliest followers of the Prophet, peace be upon him. He grew up in the Prophet's uh, household uh, as a younger uh, person. Uh, then he married the Prophet's daughter, so he's very close to the Prophet. And it, it, there are sayings in Sunni collections uh, about the uh, preeminence of Ali. And uh, it is even mentioned that uh, uh, when the Prophet, peace be upon him uh, spoke about going out on a mission uh, and leaving Ali behind, uh, he left uh, uh, Ali saying that I'm leaving you as uh, Moses had left Aaron. Uh, the, mm -hmm. uh, our Shiite brothers and sisters even point to something more. They say that when the Prophet, peace be upon him, was coming back from his last pilgrimage to Mecca, uh, back to his new home in, in Medina, uh, where he would pass away a few months later, he had specifically during that uh, journey uh, designated uh, uh, Ali, uh, may God be pleased with him, uh, as uh, the one on whom he is leaving the wilaya or or the the trust of the of the Muslim entity, uh, mm -hmm. the, the polity basically. Uh, so. Uh, with, with these two different perspectives, you can imagine that uh, uh, both sides are solidified on their um, their, their rejection of the other narrative and mm -hmm. uh, the preservation of their own. And uh, this has been a situation of being too close for comfort. Uh, but of course, this, is a, uh, this, this uh, lack of uh, comfort is something we have to, to uh, get over. And we have to enter into more dialogue. Uh, we have to express more tolerance, mutual love, and uh, understanding and appreciation uh, of the other. Because uh, we are dealing with something here that is not so clear, cl clear cut, black and white. If it was so clear cut, uh, it, it wouldn't have led to do two different opinions among the earliest uh, Muslims on this issue. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Shapir, I want to go over uh, time a little bit and ask you, you know, what do you think that Sunni Muslims should do? Because Sunni Muslims are in the normative position, they're in the position of privilege, right? It's not an equal playing field, right? So what do you think that Sunni Muslims should do to try and be more welcoming, understanding, accommodating of uh, Shiite Muslims? 
Yeah, in today's context, Safiya, uh, we Sunni Muslims are always uh, asking uh, the public to be tolerant and respectful uh, of our faith. And, and we do complain if anyone crosses the line uh, with us. Uh, and naturally, in a modern secular uh, democracy, we have every right to, to complain in this way. But we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that there is uh, sectarian violence at the same time. And uh, much mm -hmm. of this sectarian violence is directed from the Sunni majority to uh, um, sects uh, and, and my, to minority sects uh, within the religion of Islam. Uh, so uh, we cannot have it to both ways. We cannot, on the one hand, be appealing to public sentiment uh, when we are the underdog. And at the same time, we are trying to lord it over uh, other persons who uh, go also by the name of Muslim, though we may not agree with them on every theological point, uh, and, and these points are worth discussing in friendly, uh, open, and uh, uh, academic dialogue. Uh, at the same time, we have to be tolerant and respectful, as tolerant and respectful uh, of the other as we expect others to be tolerant and respectful uh, to us. All right, we'll leave it at that. Thank you for your time, Dr. Shabir. You're welcome.